In this little presentation, we're just going to talk about solutions and solubility. So, which means that when you dissolve something in something, then does it dissolve? Does it not dissolve? What kind of a solution do you make? All those kind of things. So, let's talk what a solution is. A solution is going to be something uh, where a solvent and a solute are involved. Okay, and so um, when a solute dissolves in a solvent, you get a solution. How do you know what is a solute, what's a solvent? The solute is in a smaller quantity and the solvent is in a higher quantity. So that's how you know that you have a solvent and a solute. It's all about quantities. When the two substances that you're trying to dissolve, the solute and the solvent, if they're completely soluble, then it would be a homogeneous solution or a mixture. If they are not completely miscible in each other, then they would look like a heterogeneous mixture, which means you can tell that, you know, you have two different things involved in there. So uh, that's how you tell if you have a solution or not. And again, in homogeneous substances, it's very hard to tell uh, that you actually have a solution or not. So you, and you have to do analysis and all that. A solute and a solvent can be of any different phase. So this table over here gives you a nice example of uh, the different kinds of solutes, the different kinds of solvents, what the phase would look like for the resulting solution. And then of course, some examples over here. So uh, gas can dissolve in gas, which is absolutely fine because that's the air that is right in front of us. And that's a homogeneous solution because everything is completely mixed in each other. And even if you have a colored gas that might be mixed in a not colored gas, then even then it still looks homogeneous because it's still one. Okay, so you can't tell that you have a mixture or not. You can have a gas dissolved in a liquid. Again, this is carbonated beverages, very common. Okay, we see that all the time and that's a solution. So the gas is the solute there. Gas can be dissolved in the solid also. The example given here is uh, hydrogen gas in palladium and palladium is of course a metal. So the hydrogen gas would be actually on the surface of the uh, palladium and that is called adsorption not absorption like ad not ab um, so adsorption of hydrogen gas on palladium and uh, another example of gas in solid would be like foam okay that you have in um, general like cleaning things and all that you can have a liquid dissolved in liquid very common kind of a solution and again you can have um, Homogeneous solutions in this case and heterogeneous also depending on the solubility of the two substances and then liquid solid solid liquid and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so you can see all of this. The last one I want to mention just a little bit the solid and solid. This is also called alloys. Okay, and alloy is when you have two metals that are mixed with each other. Metals don't combine with each other. They will only mix in each other. Okay, because if you have two metals. Um, you cannot form a bond. Okay, the bond there is a metallic bond, which really is not one of those traditional covalent or ionic kind of bonds. But anyhow, when you have two metals mixed in each other, that would be called an alloy, A L L O Y. Okay. So then there are different kinds of solutions. Okay, and the, the, the different kinds of solutions would be dilute, concentrated, saturated and supersaturated. In the textbooks, you may not, not found uh, concentrated solutions, but I'm gonna mention it to you here because uh, you will see this in the lab. And you know we talk about concentrated solutions all the time, so it's a good idea to kind of just learn what they are. So in case of a dilute solution, which is also called an unsaturated solution, you have a small amount of solute in the, sol uh, in the solvent. So which means that you can actually dissolve more solute in it. When you have a concentrated solution, then you have more solute than the dilute solution, okay? But not to the maximum solubility, which means that you can still dissolve more solute in there. The difference between the dilute and concentrated is just in the amount of solute, okay, that you have in the solvent. So for example, if you have a one molar solution of sodium chloride versus six molar solution of sodium chloride, the six molar has more solute, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's saturated. Okay, it is concentrated because you have more solute in there. So there is a degree of it. Okay, in the case of saturated solutions, you have the maximum amount of solute, okay, that you can have at a given temperature. 
So in saturated solutions, you cannot dissolve any more solute at a given temperature. Now, this is really an important thing because later on we'll talk about solubility and temperature. So which means that uh, you can increase the solubility of substances generally by increasing the temperature. So at a given temperature, say like 25 degrees Celsius at room temperature, there's only a certain amount of substance you can dissolve okay, in a, in a, in a solvent. So that would be saturated sol uh, solution. A concentrated solution then, remember, is not necessarily a saturated solution, okay? So there's differences in the, in the amount of solute you have. And then there is a supersaturated solution. In a supersaturated solution, you have more solute than a saturated solution. So, which means it's a very unstable kind of uh, substance, okay? So here are some pictures that go with it. So for example, when you have a dilute solution, you have a little bit of sol uh, solute in there. You add a little bit more in there and then you get a saturated solution. Saturated means that it's not more soluble at all anymore. So which means once you have this kind of a system going on where the solid is not dissolving in the liquid, in this case, um, then what you would do is filter it at this point, and then you can say that, okay, now my solution is concentrated, because as soon as you dissolve any more solid, it's not gonna dissolve, it's gonna sit at the bottom of the beaker. However, when you take that saturated solution and you heat it, it becomes supersaturated. So when you cool this supersaturated solution down, sometimes, the excess of the solute does not precipitate out because uh, when you dissolve something at a higher temperature, when you bring it down to a lower temperature, that solute which you dissolved at the higher temperature should actually come out, okay, or precipitate out of the solution, but sometimes it doesn't, okay, and that's what makes a supersaturated solution, and that is why it's an unstable condition. So in those cases, uh, you will have uh, a solution that on a very small uh, motion or something like that, it will completely uh, crystallize, okay, where all the solute will just, boom, precipitate out, okay. Anyhow, how to make all these solutions, dilute solutions, you just have to dissolve, concentrate it, same thing, okay, you dissolve the solute in the solvent, no issues there. To make a saturated amount, uh, solution, you'll have to keep adding the solute until nothing dissolves, and sometimes a good idea is to actually heat it up a little bit, so that you ensure maximum solubility and then you cool it down and then you filter it. So that way you know that you got the maximum um, sol uh, solute in the solvent. Now, it's not so easy to create a supersaturated solution as you might think. We say it's supersaturated, but sometimes it's not easy to create that, okay? Because a lot of things will just precipitate out when you cool the solutions. So it's only in some cases that uh, the supersaturated solution will not cool out. And in those cases, that's what's called supersaturated. And then let's not forget the role of the intermolecular forces in solutions. I mentioned this to you um, a while back when we were talking about intermolecular forces. But again, here is your rule. Like dissolves like. Uh, polar substances will dissolve in polar solvents, nonpolar in nonpolar, and so on. Okay, so that's how it works. You have to look at the intermolecular forces of both the solute and the solvent. Okay, and if then they match up, then it will be fine. So uh, in polar substances, for example, hydrogen bonded substances, they will dissolve readily in, di uh, in hydrogen bonded uh, solvents. And then dipole-dipole uh, forces will dissolve in hydrogen bonding as well as dipole-dipole and so on, okay? So for example, if you look at water and acetone, okay? And they both have the same kind of forces because H2O has hydrogen bonding, which is a version of dipole-dipole forces. And so does acetone because of this oxygen over here, it creates that polarity. And so you have a dipole-dipole force going on. So in both of them, they have dipole-dipole. So here you have a nice solution and you can see that both of them are completely mixed up. Here we have water and dichloromethane, and dichloromethane uh, is, has hardly any kind of dipole interaction. This is more of a dispersion forces because there is no hydrogen bonding uh, and there is hardly any um, dipole-dipole interaction. Water, on the other hand, has dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding also, and so uh, therefore these two forces don't match up, and because they don't match up, they're not miscible, okay? So which means that you will have these two layers, 
which you can see here also. Now, which layer is top, which is bottom, depends on the density of the substance. And the top one here is the water because water is less dense than dichloromethane if there was something else which is insoluble. So, for example, when you think about uh, petrol and when we have oil spills, sadly, the oil spills actually are all usually at the, uh, at the surface of the water, and that's because all the petroleum products, they have lower density than water, so they will be above, but they don't dissolve in water, okay? They will be kind of at the surface, um, and if they are denser than water, then of course they'll sit at the bottom, okay? So either case, you can separate them out because the intermolecular forces in petroleum products and water is not the same. So let's look at an example, okay, of solubility and the kind of questions you might get from me. Um, it's identify the solute and the solvent in the following solutions and then indicate if they will be soluble in each other. And so the first one is 80 grams of uh, chromium and uh, 5 grams of molybdenum. Now when you're trying to answer this question over here, the first one, you have 80 grams of chromium and 5 grams of molybdenum. The first thing is a solute is going to be the smaller amount, solvent is the larger amount, okay? And so which means that molybdenum is the solute and chromium is a solvent. Then the next question is, of course, will they be soluble in each other? And yes, they can be mixed because they're both metals, they're both solids, so they will form an alloy, okay? And so yeah, so A is all fine, uh, we know what the answer is. For question B, 5 grams of magnesium chloride and 1,000 grams of water. 1,000 grams of water would be your solvent because that's the larger quantity. Regarding the solubility now, the magnesium chloride is ionic and water is polar, so they will both dissolve. The intermolecular forces that, in, that play over here are going to be ion dipole and dipole dipole. Okay, so water is dipole forces and magnesium chloride will experience the ion dipole forces then in water. So that's how it will be. Will it be a homogeneous solution? Yes, because magnesium chloride is uh, soluble, okay, in water. And then the last one, 39% nitrogen, 41% argon, and the rest is oxygen. So in this case, you might have to do a little bit of calculation, but even otherwise, 41% argon should be your solvent. The rest of the two should be the solute, okay, in there. Now, all three of them are gases, so they should all dissolve in each other, no problems, and then they will form a mixture, okay, because why? They're all non-polar gases. There is hardly anything that is different between um, any of them. Okay, so that should form a nice solution, also homogeneous solution. So solubility and temperature now, I said before that I will talk about this a little bit, and yes, this is an important factor. So in general, what we say is that the solubility of a substance will increase with temperature. And to understand that fact, we have to understand what kind of a process is solubility, which means uh, whether it's exothermic process or endothermic process, because when we're talking about heat energy, then we're talking endo or exothermic. So in case if it's an endothermic process, which means it absorbs energy, then um, you will have to increase the temperature to increase the solubility. If heat is given out, okay, so for example, if heat is given out, if it's an exothermic process, then the solution will need to be cooled. So you dissipate the heat, you remove the heat, and that's how you increase the solubility. So in general, for most salts, uh, for most substances, solubility is an endothermic process, which means it requires energy okay, to dissolve. In few cases, it's an exothermic process. And this is something that you really have to go in the lab and figure out, okay? It's not something that I can ask you to predict. Uh, in general, you can say it's endothermic, but otherwise, um, you will have to go in the lab and see if something is an exo or an endothermic process. A classic example of an exothermic process is sodium hydroxide in water. When we're trying to dissolve sodium hydroxide, and make a solution, say two molar, three molar solution of sodium hydroxide. It's a highly exothermic process and the flask or the beaker gets really hot, okay, when you're making the solution. So that's an exothermic process, which means what we have to do then is we have to cool this in a water bath or an ice bath in order to increase the solubility of sodium hydroxide. So you can't heat it and, you know, think that you want to increase the solubility. That's not going to happen, okay? And so an endothermic process, heat it. So this graph over here gives you a general idea as to how the solubility increases with um, temperature. So here's the amount of substance and here is the temperature. So generally, um, you know, for most things, the solubility is going to increase with temperature. There are very few things in which solubility decreases, which tells you then 
that at the dissolving of this solute, then it's probably an exothermic process and not an endothermic process. Gases are a completely different thing. That kind of a solubility chart that you saw in the previous slide has to do a lot with the solid and liquid solutions. Uh, but when you're talking about gases, things are a little bit different, okay? And the solubility then will depend on two conditions, pressure and temperature, also temperature, okay? But also pressure because gases are very dependent on pressure, okay? Their behavior changes. So um, Henry's law, you might have heard of this before, you may not have heard of this before, but in any case, solubility of gases increases with pressure of the gas, okay? And so if you increase the pressure, you also increase the solubility of a gas in anything. And that is how pressurized containers or pressurized solutions are made. So for example, carbonated beverages, they're all under pressure, okay? So the, the gases have been pushed inside the, uh, the, sol uh, the solvent there, the liquid solvent, in order to increase the solubility. Now regarding the temperature part, um, solubility decreases with temperature. If you increase the temperature, then what are you doing? Okay, you're providing more energy. If you provide more energy, the gas molecules start moving faster. And when they're moving faster, they will escape. Okay, that's just a very simple logical step, which means that if you want to actually take a gas and keep it dissolved in any kind of a solution, then you need to have high, to, uh, high pressure and low temperature. Those are the ideal conditions to keep uh, a gas dissolved in solution. So carbonated beverage will stay very well if you keep it cool and if you keep it closed down, okay? So that the pressure does not really change uh, too much, okay? And so um, that's how solubility of gases would be. And yes, I can ask you these conditions, okay? There is, this is a very simple kind of uh, condition to remember. We will talk more about this, by the way, in class. Um, I'll mention a little bit about how gases affect divers and uh, how gases and solubility will affect um, people in surgery and all that. So we'll talk about that in class. So your key concepts in this very small presentation is you should be able to predict the solubility of different substances and you should be able to tell whether something is a dilute, concentrated or a supersaturated solution if I give you the quantities, okay, of something. And then please, uh, you know, you should be able to predict solubility, okay, of substances with temperature. That goes for gases also, 